We've got a, um, a whole range of different um, values and goals and strategies in, in PACE. And one of them is to do an iconic building every, every two or three years. One that uh, we can all get really excited about. It's not necessarily about, about making profit. It's about building a reputation and having fun. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas, and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello, and welcome to episode 61 of the show. Thanks for joining me. Trust you're well. I am doing very well myself. How are your projects going? Hopefully, everything is on track. It's been a little while between episodes, as some of you have noticed. Thanks for all the emails, checking on my welfare. I have been absolutely fine. I've taken up a contract role and that has been keeping me busy. So that's the main reason for the break in transmission. The trip to VCAT two years ago put a big hole in my project pipeline, which is really being felt now. And that, along with a softening in the Melbourne property market, has had a big impact on my cash flow. So I decided to get a job to plug the hole, and it's been good. Being part of a team and back in a corporate environment has been really beneficial in lots of ways, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be back in the workforce. On the project front, things have been slowly moving along. We launched our sales campaign for our permitted project and got off to a great start, but since then it's been challenging getting some off-the-plan contracts signed. The agent and me have been trying lots of different marketing angles to try and generate inquiries, so fingers crossed we can land some sales in the next few months. Interest seems to be increasing with the spring selling season starting in Melbourne, and there seems to be a sense of optimism coming back to the market. In the meantime, we've finished the construction documentation and sent that off to the builder for him to provide a formal quote for the job, which I'm expecting any day now. On my other project, we are still in planning. After the public notice period, we were advised by council that they wouldn't support our scheme, despite our many changes and the lack of public objections. So I made some amendments and resubmitted our plans, and Council, in their infinite wisdom, decided they needed to advertise the changes again. So we're waiting to see what the outcome of that is. Fingers crossed we can quickly move through this process and get a permit before the year is out. So overall, things are slowly moving ahead with a few hurdles to overcome. Just before we get to today's guest, don't forget, if you are interested in learning how to develop property safely and profitably, then email me about the Property Developing Mentoring Program that is available to help you get started. There's nothing like a guiding hand to show you the best way when you're starting out, particularly to avoid the many pitfalls that exist in property developing. So email me, justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com and I'll send you some further information. Okay, on to today's guest a guy who has been developing property since he was 19 and has so far done more than 100 projects. Shane Wilkinson is the founder and managing director of Melbourne's Pace Development Group. Over 21 years, Pace has delivered more than 2,000 homes and more than $2 billion worth of real estate, including one of Melbourne's most recognisable buildings, the Icon, overlooking St Kilda Junction. Anyone who's been to Melbourne and been to St Kilda will recognise the colourful building at the junction that uh, is very striking. The company has four projects currently under construction, three settling later this year, and a further 1,758 apartments, if you don't mind, in its pipeline. It's a long way from Shane's humble beginnings doing a simple duplex project in suburban Melbourne. We have a great conversation covering a host of topics, including what Shane has learned along the way, the biggest pickle he has found himself in, and the one thing you need to focus on if you want to succeed in property developing. Also, keep an ear out for Shane's advice for how to deal with problems. This is a broad discussion which I'm sure you will enjoy. As usual, I started off by asking Shane what food he would eat until he was sick, and his answer was very simple. (laughs) I'd have to be donuts, I'd say. (laughs) <laughs> old school, just the traditional ones. Probably cinnamon. traditional cinnamon, cinnamon, yeah. Yeah, old school. Even some churros would be lovely too. Some churros? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, that's a bit fancy. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the donut's gone a bit fancy these days, haven't it? Yeah, I think you can get a number of different uh, different variations on those donuts now, can't you? Well, they've gone a bit crazy price-wise. They're sort of you're getting up five, get six bucks six for pack, a donut. The, the custard ones, the... Oh, yeah, custard donuts. Custard a bit donuts. soft spot there. Oh. Yeah, and the warm jam in, inside. That's very traditional. <laughs> That's very traditional. <laughs> So Shane, we're here today to talk about developing, as usual. Um, you've got a pretty large developing business. Before we get into your background, do you want to give us a bit of a sense of Pace Development Group, size of it, staff? Okay, uh, I, won't, uh, I won't bore your listeners or you for too long on this. Um, we're a fully integrated business now. We cover everything from the site acquisitions, the planning, uh, the architecture, uh, all the way through VCAT, all the way through um, design development, uh, the sales and marketing is all in-house, and so is the uh, construction uh, methodology. We've got our own construction team, We've currently got uh, 500 townhouses under construction in Sunshine, um, and five other projects across Melbourne uh, actually under construction, and another six or seven planning phase. We also own a company called Melbourne Joinery and Stone, so we do all our own stone and all our own joinery of kitchens, wardrobes, uh, laundries, which is a standalone uh, business uh, out in Morty Alec, so we, we manufacture locally. And we've got somewhere in the vicinity of 110 to 115 staff, something along those lines, across the, uh, across the whole business. That's pretty impressive. You, you started off your early days doing humble townhouse developments down in the southern Bayside area of Melbourne. Did, did. Can you take us back to the, the beginning and how you got into developing? I don't know how far back you want me to go. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning and work our way from there. Oh, look, I started at, um, uh, I did engineering at, uh, at Monash and uh, left engineering at Monash for a Builders, claw, builders course at uh, Holmes Glen TAFE. I think I was 19. I finished school when I was set, finished HSC in those days. I've got listeners who were young, they weren't. That's the old variation of VCE. Um, and then I finished my builders course when I was 19 and a half, or just turned 20, and bought a property in the Bayside suburb of Hyatt, um, number 15 Barnett Street to be exact. Paid one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. I don't know how I remember this crap, but um, one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars for it. In those days, you could put a dual occupancy as of right without having to apply for a planning permit. So I proceeded to use my uh, newfound skill set to build a, uh, a single-story villa unit at the rear of this old existing weatherboard home, um, which I did. And it's still standing today. I think I drove past the thing a couple of years ago to make sure it was still standing, but that's, uh, that's nearly 25, uh, 25 years ago. Um, so a long time ago. You'd be lucky to buy a front door in Hyatt for 100000 these days. Yeah, I think the house opposite <laughs> is exactly the same and just sold for a bit of a million dollars or something. So it gives you an indication in the last 25 years how property prices in that, uh, in that vicinity have, uh, have changed. Yeah, so duplex and then? Um, sold that. Uh, I think I was, I was working three or four jobs at the time, so I was still um, uh, still working, not, not development or building wasn't my main uh, source of income at that point. And poured every dollar that we had into that, uh, into that venture. Bearing in mind, it was 1992, and if anyone remembers 1992, it's the uh, worst property crash that we've uh, we've ever had. Um, I think I made the grand total of about seven grand and if I worked out my labour cost, I think I would have been backwards. But somehow I, uh, I gathered the strength and continued. Um, I remember just another quick point about family and what have you. I was $3,000 short on settling because I couldn't get the amount of bank finance that I needed to get and I remember um, going to see my grandmother at that time and uh, begged and pleaded for, for three grand. Um, and she gave it to me, luckily, a day before settlement, and we settled it. And uh, 
and that was if, I, mum and dad I asked and they said no so um, I was going to forfeit the 10% deposit that we paid and I was you know, late late 19 maybe just 20 and this is all uh, this is all happening and then uh, look well to pay your grandma pay, back pardon to you pay your grandma back yes, I did. With, did with, interest, equity stake in the... with interest with interest <laughs> but then um, then she uh, she got back to me uh, when she passed away, <laughs> so a little bit of a, a interesting uh, uh, nuance there. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure she had a laugh about that. Uh, sold those two those two homes for something like about 110 or 115 thousand dollars each, and uh, went and bought another property in Moorabbin. In those days, it was Moorabbin, not Hampton East. It's been rezoned in the last uh, 20 odd years, and. Put two, this time put two went up a planning permit and put two villa units, single story villa units at the back of the existing house. Renovated the existing house. Um, uh, also built two villa units at the back. Sold the um, the old house at the front first. Used that money and the ones at the rear. Yeah. Da, 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 da. This is not an old story. It's uh, you know I'm sure many people in Australia or around the world have done this um, done this technique. And I was also doing small building jobs for other people and. Came to the conclusion over my early, very early twenties that it's better just to do it for ourselves. So we sold those three and continued to buy, and we went into another two properties, and uh, then it went to five villa units and five townhouses to ten townhouses to twenty townhouses. Um, slowly got into into shop top dwellings in Hyatt, Hampton, Brighton, buying shops and putting. Um, putting small apartments either on the top or at the back and that evolution has just continued in the last 25 years and um, I think this year we'll probably deliver or between now or what are we now we're in September um, between now and the end of the year we've got to deliver close to 400 uh, apartments and townhouses between now and uh, I'll hand them over to their new buyers so that's the it's obviously a substantial amount of discussion and um, Little wins, little successes, all the way through that that uh, that twenty. I've just I've just missed twenty years um, of the evolution. So if you'd like to delve into that at some point, I'm more than happy for you to ask me any question. Yeah, well, if you jump onto the Pace website and go through the past uh, projects page, it's pretty long. <laughs> yeah, we've done well over a hundred projects, and um, you know, obviously varying in size, but each one we try and make sure it's better than the next. Yeah, well, you can definitely see the natural evolution, and I think you've done at least one very iconic building here in Melbourne, which is at the St Kilda Junction, not too far from where we are, which is, uh, I think it was called the Iconic, wasn't it? It was. It was called Icon. Um, and look, an amazing building, JCB designed. And the, the beauty in that building is in the detailing. It's not in, uh, if you're, you're up close looking at it, an incredible building. It's been painted by Matthew Johnson, a, a Australia, one of Australia's leading um, artists. So when I mean painted across the whole building, I know anyone who's from Melbourne will know the building. It's uh, got 56 different colours on it and approximately 400 different panels that are about 450 wide by about 3.1 metres high. And each one of those panels has been individually uh, painted by um, the colours were chosen. Matthew Johnson went down with a mock-up model down to Dulux and, uh, and they mixed the colours and developed the building with, in conjunction with Dulux and uh, got a great result. Yeah, well it's really unusual isn't it because it's each floor or it's got these sort of segments that are rotated off centre and it's, it's not a linear rectangular sort of shaped building is it? It's not, and it's one of those buildings that when we were originally pitched the design by the architects, I, I, I wasn't convinced. And to be completely frank with you, um, it was, they were relatively hard to sell. Uh, it was a market we were in end of 2015, 2016. Um, I, at that point, thought that the market was not going in the right direction. And we got them across the line and they ended up selling, but now driving past the building, I'm immensely proud. 
gets out, it gets amazing. I mean, I ride past through the junction quite often, and you just can't help it. You look, your like eye line. look how bloody fit you are. <laughs> <laughs> There's no camera here, yeah. trust me, he's fit. <laughs> That's all right, the two of us have got good heads for podcasting. Um, yeah, and it's certainly an eye catching building. But, but talk, talk us through that when the architect comes to you with a concept and you go, I'm not really sure about this. How did you, why did you proceed with it? Oh, look, we've got a, um, a whole range of different um, values and goals and strategies in, in PACE. And one of them is to do an iconic building every, every two or three years. One that uh, we can all get really excited about. It's not necessarily about, about making profit it's about building a reputation and having fun. And that's just one of those buildings. The other one was the one in, um, in Nordica. It's actually a picture behind you there, that one there, the old the boats up at the um, Sandringham Yacht Club. So that was the other one we did before that. And the next one is, uh, is Flemington, which uh, we're, we're hopefully getting planning approval for that over the next couple of months. Yeah, well, speaking of having fun, I don't think you had a lot of fun going through the planning process for the icon did you no no i think we had 300 and something objections and i remember it being on channel 7 news at some point and uh it got a lot of uh a lot of negative press but i even remember the vcat member's name um uh Chimino, and gee he, he backed us and uh very very happy he did yeah i think i've read somewhere that you once you had all the objections, you were kind of questioning whether or not this was the right thing to do or the way to go, but you decided to push ahead. What, what we did, we, and we put traditional car parking in there too. So it's got five, it's five levels underground. Anyone who knows anything about construction, it's a very small site, it's about 1,000 square metres. And we are uh, every bit of 18 or 19 metres into the ground, including the footings and the, and the structure. So a very, very difficult build. Um, there's some cantilevers there that are four or five metres uh, off, off, offsetting from levels above. Um, it, was a, it was a complex build and a very difficult one, challenging, but pretty exciting. It was fun. It got the team rallied. We looked at different te- techniques from around the world about how to, how to build it structurally, um, and it was fun. I'm sure you've had to deal with a lot of objections having done over 100 projects. <laughs> What's your advice for, for dealing with those, or how have you gone... Coping with them? Uh, look, I, each project requires a different, um, a different cocktail solution. And VCAT's gone in, in different waves over the last 20 years. There were times 15 years ago when you were, you were very, very confident that VCAT was going to give you a positive result if you did the right things. And as the framing, uh, the, the structural framing of planning gets better and better, which it has over the last certain last 10 years, and it's getting better as we, as we go forward. Where What I mean by that is that the government and councils are allocating areas that are developable. These are the go zones, and they're, they're quarantining, if you like, residential areas where there are no go zones. So you're not a smart, educated developer who's, who's savvy, knows the areas that are go zones, and buys the appropriate property and therefore reduces your amount of conflict and the amount of tension and the amount of friction to get a planning permit. Well, but as someone it. as someone who's bought in one of those go zones and not had a successful outcome at VCAT, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll uh, have to waver on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you've obviously had a few trips to VCAT over the years, I presume. Uh, I think I've been there about. Probably 50, 50 or sixty times. Yeah. And what's the strike rate like? Oh, look, we get we always get there in the end. Some some we lose and we, we go back. So Wellington Street, St Kilda, um, uh, High Street, Mount Waverley. Just recently, in the last couple of years, we lost them at, at VCAT and uh, went back to the drawing board. Uh, and VCAT are great these days. They give you most members will give you some guidelines about look, we like this, we didn't like this, this is why we refused it, and this is how you can possibly rectify it and uh, tweak the drawings and go back to, come back to us and we'll give you a good show. And that's, that's been, a, if, if I can say anything about VCAT, that's been one of the major, um, major positives. The other one while I'm talking about VCAT is the uh, compulsory conference. It's, it's great to be able to sit in a relaxed environment, um, 
controlled by our experienced member and you can actually have an intelligent, rational discussion because if there's anything that gets residents' blood running, it's building a block of apartments or a high-rise next door to you or down the road from you. Um, you know, they're, they're just scared that the, they're going to be letting people in and over the years, this is the only conclusion, like the other conclusion I've come to of why people object so vehemently to uh, development is because they think that an underclass of some description is going to come into their suburb and, shall we say, politically correct, just liquefy. Wreck the, the giant. And wreck the giant, okay, we can say <laughs> that. And that's probably true. Um, that's exactly what they think, and the reality of it is could not be further from the truth. Um, especially now, given investors aren't in the marketplace, all the product, certainly 80% of the product we produce now is owner-occupier product. Um, communities are developing, we're creating um, platforms. When I say platforms, I'm talking about virtual platforms where um, the, the building occupants communicate with each other, there's no virtual notice boards, they are becoming really great places to live. Um, pools on roofs, steam rooms, meeting rooms, dining rooms you can book out when you've got your family party. They're just, they're not anything like the product that we we're all delivering 15 years ago. A bit different from the duplex in Hyatt 20 years ago. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> 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 Even though that duplex right now would be worth a fortune. <laughs> when you look back at those early projects compared to the big complex ones that you're doing now, are there things you miss about the, the little ones? Um, not really. I think everyone's on, an, on, a, on their own journey and I just like continually challenging ourselves. Uh, myself and the team follows. Um, I just like to, to be honest, wake up every single morning and just be excited about what I'm doing today. And if I'm not changing, not progressing, not uh, growing, uh, not challenging myself every day, I, I'm not excited. And I can't see, I can't imagine a life where I'm not waking up in the morning and jumping out of bed and want to get home from the gym because I want to go to work. That's, that's, that's what I want out of my life. And then what's, what, what do you reckon the key differences are between those sort of smaller projects when you started out and these bigger complex ones? Look, I think once you break through a ceiling, and I, I haven't really, I've never spoken about this before, but um, if you're not from a wealthy family, if you're not from um, somewhere where you can have access to a large amount of, or even a small amount of capital, at the start when you're starting out. I don't know whether any of your listeners are, are trying to start out and are trying to get um, their head above water, but at the moment, there couldn't be a worse environment to try and start a development business or a construction business. There couldn't be a worse environment. Banks are only lending to people they've lent to before that have a huge balance sheet that they know they're going to get their money back from. Taking a risk on, uh, on a newcomer, uh, not tried, not tested, hard work and I you, you until you break through the ceiling it is it's all in or you're not going to make it I don't know any, any other way I can put it I mean all in there is nothing else in your life other than doing what you what you set out to do and nothing otherwise you're just not going to get there and when you talk about the ceiling what is it that you mean by that yeah, breaking through a ceiling um, once you've got a lot of runs on the board and a good history, you've got money in the bank, you've got your own equity, it's only then that things start to get a little bit easier. Uh, from a finance perspective, from a sales perspective, uh, buyers are slowly at last becoming more educated uh, where they're buying brands, they're buying people that stand behind the product, they're buying proven entities. They're it's exactly the same as, as choosing a car. Uh, you, you go and buy a BMW, you know it's gonna cost you $60,000. You can buy exactly the same car with all the same, not exactly the same car, but the same, a car with the same features, but a different brand being, let's use Hyundai, not that I've, um, 
I've never driven one, so I don't know what they're like, for $20,000. This is a massive cost difference in cars and no matter of fact, anything else that you buy, there's a huge cost differentiation between a proven brand with backup um, with a service system at least and a brand that they're going to stand behind and produce and they know you're going to, you know they're going to produce a great product. In property, there is a tiny differentiation between buying through an established brand who's done this a thousand times before, knows what they're doing and is going to give you an amazing product with an amazing backup service and, a, and be there for that 10 year warranty period rather than ducking and weaving compared to someone that's not. The price differentiation might be two to three percent. What other industry in the entire world does that exist? It doesn't. So the buyers are slowly starting to come on to this, this bandwagon. But getting back to your question, it, you, just need, you just need to be able to build a brand and stand by it, be out and proud um, about your brand and, and your reputation is everything. You can, I, I write this, I wrote a letter to recently to our customer care division, which is the division which looks after all our, uh, our apartments, townhouses and offices for that matter, after we've constructed them and settled. And essentially the letter says, we can afford to lose money. And we can, we can probably afford to lose a lot of money, but we cannot afford to lose one shred of reputation, not one. It takes decades to build and minutes to lose. So place yourself in the position of the, the customer, place yourself in the position of the homeowner and and be, have common sense. That's essentially the internal document that's been circulated and I truly believe it. And so you've obviously had to take some risks over time or perhaps you perceive that you haven't in terms of getting bigger doing a bigger projects <laughs> when you talk about going all in i mean is that still the case or do you get to a level where your risk tolerance moderates or do you just keep yeah, I think rolling the dice at the start of uh, anyone's career in any industry it's it's all in uh, if and a bank is not going to give you any money if you are not all in now, I mean, I'm not just saying all in from a, from a finance perspective. Of course you have to be in all finance, from a finance perspective. But I mean from a dedication um, perspective. There is nothing else in your life other than what you're trying to achieve. Um, and to obtain finance from a bank, you need to be able to let them see your passion, see you, that you're going to stand behind, and, and they're going to get their money back. Because you really can't start um, a development business or a building business without a, a some sort of finance from a bank or from a second tier lender which are taking up you know, your max caps your portalis um, of the world uh, are taking a large share of what the banks used to do i mean in perspective it's not a, not a huge amount from the banks but um that's another subject for another discussion i'm sure and so i'm guessing if finance is something that's probably got a bit more complicated from the from years ago in terms of the project structures is that the case? Do you have to get more sophisticated with how you uh, finance and structure your deals, or is it they're just there's more um, zeros involved? No, look, it, it, it doesn't matter what size the project is these days. It, it needs to, it, it's very complex. Um, if I look back twenty years ago, or even fifteen years ago, it was a, it was pretty linear, pretty simple. Um, bankers and finances were sophisticated in certain areas, but certainly you look back at it now, very, very simple. Um, now it's all about risk mitigation. It's about uh, your qualifying pre-sales. It's about um, the market acceptance of your product. It's about uh, what these products are gonna be uh, valued at the end. Can people settle? Um, what's, the, uh, what's the horizon on the project? Therefore, what's the market going to be like, and what's the valuation market going to be like in there? And how it is—it's a complicated cocktail, and I don't know any other way to say it. it. You just need to have all your bases covered, and if you buy a site, you need really good planning advice. And I know that 
the biggest risk in any any site we've ever bought is always planning. It's always planning. It has such a major impact on the overall development. Yeah, I mean, I've found the planning process to be getting more challenging and taking longer. I don't know, is that your experience? Look, it is. Um, but look, we, we allow more time now to, to talk to councils, but we do so much due diligence before we buy a site. There's no um, see a site in the morning like I used to do 20 years ago and buying it in the afternoon. <laughs> um, you know, those days are well gone. Uh, there are a number of people you've got to bring along for the ride in that DD process, and sometimes that can take a number of weeks. Um, environmental concerns are huge. Um, uh, geotechnical issues are huge, rock, water tables, um, it's, it's complicated. Uh, you've got to bring your financier along for the ride as well to make sure that you've got backing. Not that we have to do that anymore, um, but certainly it is gone by. We had to make sure that all the pieces were in the puzzle before we bought a site. A little bit more flexibility now, we're a bit bigger, but yeah, those fundamentals still apply. Do you reckon you still get a gut feel when you look at a site? Oh, of course, yeah, of course, and and you you've got to make sure that you don't let that gut feel override the data, the facts. What is the likelihood and what is the risk profile of getting X planning permit above Y? I.e., can you get 160 apartments or can you get 130? What size are they? What's the mix got to be? Um, What's, in the, what's the buyer market, the buyer profile right now? Uh, when are investors returning to the market? Are they, uh, is there a bonus for first home buyers? So therefore you've got to try and, you've got to try and look into the crystal ball and, and design your project around what you anticipate the market to be wanting in 18 months to two years or when do you think you can get the thing onto the market after you've got the planning permit. So. Of course, you can make modifications along the way and combine and split and what have you, but there's also delays with that. You try and get as close to the dartboard as you possibly can imagine. Of course, we, no, we don't get it right all the time, no matter how experienced we are. We've got a huge team um, here that, that that's all they do, and we still, we still get it wrong. Yeah, well, there's so many moving parts in the development, and as you talk, as you say, the, the length of time that they take to go from idea to completion is so long and things can, so many things can change in between. Um, I mean, I know myself, bought a site, top of the market, heat comes out, suddenly you're in a completely different market trying to sell, but knowing when it's finished, it's going to be a different market again, but you've got to deal with what's in front of you. You do, yeah. you do. And if it's, if you've got debt on it, it's not returning any money, you can only hold that thing for so long. Yeah. And so I guess you've come up with a fairly detailed due diligence checklist that you go through now for a, for a site? We do, yeah, we do. It's, as I said, alluded to before, it's a very long and detailed um, list, but it starts with planning and goes all the way through to uh, environmental issues. It goes through to what the neighbours are. Um, we, in some cases, we may even go and see the neighbours and talk to them, um, either in the view of combining that to the site and making it larger or to at least notify them that, and see how um, what, what their feeling is towards it, and if they if they know what's what's happening, that's look, I, I could spend a lot of time on this on the DD that we go through, but it's not just producing a feasibility on the back of a napkin. Although that is that is the number one uh, step. If it doesn't work on the back of a napkin when I'm having a coffee when we've looked at the site and we don't get a good gut feel that I'd live there and be able to produce an amazing amenity and good feel that someone would want to make them, make it their home long term, it doesn't get past point one. Yeah, we've got some pretty big sites lately, or in the last couple of years. You went into a uh, pretty big tower development in Blackburn, which is we in have. eastern Melbourne. We have. We've got, uh, I think it's about 11,000 square metres of office, just under 200 apartments and a whole heap of retail. In there. That'll be fun. It's good. We've, we've gone to market with Towers 1 and 2, uh, or C and D, I think they're called. And out of the first 126, I think we've sold about 50 at the moment. So that went on the market about six months ago. Sales rate's a lot slower than what it normally is, but look, it's a very, 
it's a it's a well it's an economical product and Pace know what we do well. We we build BMW three series uh, for a very reasonable price. <laughs> so that's the analogy. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about the market. I mean, it has been soft. I, mean, I personally have experienced the difficulty in getting off the plan sales across the line. Have you been finding that as well? And if so, what have you been doing to counteract it? Uh, look, I, I say this, but things over the last few weeks have actually picked up. Um, during February and March, April, and then mid into the election, I think we had our worst months just before the election. Uh, then we had our inquiry dramatically increase. So our inquiry per week went up to approximately 130 to 140 inquiries, which means it's a, an inquiry, just to clarify, that is a someone who has had to do something to make an inquiry, whether write an email or make a telephone call or go through a display suite, something they've had to do physically to show an interest in one of our properties. So it's a relatively qualified um, lead. Those leads just weren't converting to, to contracts. So we were um, uh, in a position of a bit of a holding pattern the last few months, but the, the conversions are coming through. The market, and we, look, we've adjusted pricing a bit. We've, we've, we're leveraging our brand heavily. We are, we're doing everything we possibly can to, to reignite um, our sales pipeline. Yeah, and what do you, what's been the hesitation, do you think, with buyers? I think, it's, look, a lot of the issue is finance and having some confidence that they can obtain finance and settle the townhouse or apartment is, is one of the key fundamentals. So we, we, we spend a lot of time with um, educating our buyers, not only on, um, on what they should be looking for, whether they buy from us or buy from someone else. We educate people on buy from someone who you know who the builder is, buy from someone who's done this before, Buy from someone that has a great customer care or a great um, reputation for rectifying faults and being with you for the long journey. Buy from someone that is a brand who has a great reputation. That's number one. And if they if they buy from us, fantastic. If they don't, at least they'll have they'll be armed with a few extra questions to to go and question the other competition. We will spend a lot of time with them about what they need to do for a bank, and we know that we know they're going to analyse their their expenditure. We know that the Banking Royal Commission's been uh, been pretty intense. We know that banks have changed their criteria. So we spend a bit of time with them about what they can get finance for, and of course we suggest them some brokers, and we work, we work, we work through that journey with them. But it's just it's just a lot a lot harder than what it was. Yeah, to get people across the line, just because there's more there's more hurdles for them to jump through. It's pretty simple. Yeah, and we, we don't really have a sophisticated apartment market in Melbourne. It's getting better. But you wouldn't say we sort of have a we'll massive history. Man. But we are, gee, we're on a trajectory. If you don't say yeah. we're on a scattered market yet, we we'll definitely will be in the next 36 months. Oh, well, if you look, you look at the big cities around the world, where, I mean, Melbourne is a big city, but it's not particularly dense, I don't think, yet. Not yet. But if you look at those dense international cities, I mean, it's inevitable that you have to get start going up. And so that means apartments. Yeah. And so once, I mean, if you go to a place like New York, London, I mean, there's apartments everywhere. People are used to buying them. It's not that scary or it's not that different. You know, I, don't, I don't know if that's a question you ask me or, or a statement, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll throw my two cents worth in. And I think it's a really important part of our, of our evolution as a, as a developer. Apartments are becoming good apartments, good apartments you can live in. Now, I'll start with them. Great entrances you can be proud of. Uh, whether you're taking your mum through after you've bought or you're, you're bringing your sister or your kids or whatever it is, you need an entrance that you can be proud of and you love coming home and, and leaving every day. You need something that's going to be um, nice, white, always. You need, uh, I'm not even into the apartment yet, but this is just the external uh, before you actually get there. It'd be great to have a pool and a steam room on the roof and a dining room, somewhere you actually really enjoy living. 
Um, you can walk outside, there's either a cafe in the building or there's great restaurants down the road or um, we just bought a site in Fitzroy which I'm so um, excited about where there, it is such a beautiful street um, in Gore Street, Fitzroy. It's one of the best streets in, in Melbourne is, in my opinion. Beautiful cafes, beautiful restaurants, Gertrude Street's down the road, they've got a pool on the roof, you've got a great gym overlooking the city. It's just a, it's just a building you just enjoy living in. Um, that you combine that with a with a great social platform, a great app that comes with your, your building where you can communicate with your your um, your your, your neighbours, um, and it creates a vertical community. And getting back to your question, it, apartments are now a real alternative, built well, with good balconies. Uh, with good good ceiling heights, um, none of this 2.4, 2.5 metre ceilings, give someone a nice ceiling height. Um, ample room for your in your bedrooms where you can actually live properly. There are, there are long term, there are a heap of people now that look at apartments as a, as a long term living option. Not somewhere where it's transient, where they're oh, look I'm just staying here for a while while I save some money to buy a house. That's, that's gone. Well, it's getting so expensive to buy a house yeah, it's true. in it's Australia, true. or true. particularly in Melbourne. This is that true. idea of buying a 650 square metre block of land or whatever it is, is really, really difficult. So, holding stock, what's your view on that? Do you keep some of what you build or um, do you sell it all down? Look, I, I, we keep retail. We keep a lot of retail. We've got a, couple, a lot of supermarkets and, and the like that we've held over the years. But as far as stock goes, as far as um, apartment completed residential stock, we'll keep some, but it's not our intention to be uh, long-term holders of uh, residential stock, no. Okay. We, um, we're developers. We, we'll take that money and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pull out into the next one. I want to ask you about, you You had a, a presence at the Spring Racing Carnival here at we did. Flemington. We did. What was the thinking behind Look, it, that? And, or talk us through that a little bit. It's a little bit different. Yep. yep. Uh, it was a two-pronged approach. We've obviously got a, a project, a large project in um, in Flemington that we bought from the uh, VRC, and that launches later this year, early next. But uh, it was to get some pre-interest on that project, and of course as a brand building exercise as well. Were you happy with it? Are you doing it again this year? Oh, look, we, we, we really enjoyed it. It was a, was a, was a heap of fun. Uh, we, we're not doing it again this year, but uh, that's not to say we won't do it uh, in another time. Yeah. And you, I mean, you're a builder by trade or from the start. Do you reckon that gives you an advantage when you're a developer? I mean, you can look at plans or you can streamline construction methods or you've got a much better idea about how a buildability or how things will be built? I reckon you can answer that one on your own. <laughs> Well, I would have thought so. Uh, absolutely, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it goes with that same. Um, a lot of the team members here at Pace have been with me for you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty years in some cases, and they the the, the building knowledge is so deep in the organisation that when we're looking at an amazing design from an architect, which I know we're going through at the moment with Flemington because it's got, I think we're up to a number of twenty eight pools across the development. It's there are twenty six very large penthouses ranging from 250 square metres up to 600 square metres. Um, it's, an, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, building and I know that the depth of, of structure and efficiency um, techniques go, go run deep in the organisation and that's such a bonus. We know how big mechanical rooms have got to be. Got to be. We know how, how large and what, how many lifts we need and how we can do it, how we can efficient, make, make the structure as efficient as possible. Loading docks. So it's all, we don't need to refer out to a, um, to a third party builder. Of course, that's a major, major um, advantage. Yeah, and I remember we were talking earlier um, about vertical, inter vertical integration and you are focusing more on that over the, the coming we years. We were. Um, look, in, we, we would look at other businesses other than our um, Robin Joyner and Stone business to, as long as it fitted with us from a vertical integration perspective, um, and even better if it fitted uh, with where I see the construction industry going and making us more technologically savvy, uh, making us less labour intensive, 
um, focusing on environmental issues, recycling the water, um, solar as their um, supply of energy, with batteries and basic AI, which I um, spoke to a journalist a few weeks ago about. Um, and one of our projects in Sunshine, we've got solar panels on the roof and basic artificial intelligence that controls the amount of power that is used. It understands your uh, your habits. It knows when you're here, knows when you're not. Um, buys back from the grid at a very low rate during the night to charge the battery if need be. Obviously, clearly the solar will charge the battery during the day. It will sell back to the grid if you're at work at the high rate. And the variations at the moment are, are three times. So if you are buying it at night time, you're, you're paying a third of what you are during the peak um, uh, peak demand times uh, at night or in that early evening. So you can, with some, yeah, this, this, this is not, not rocket science, this is no Tesla vehicle we're talking about. This is basic artificial intelligence that assesses every few minutes what the, what the rate of electricity is, what you can sell it for, and knowing your uh, movements and being able to trade energy um, to either your townhouse neighbours or external from the development altogether. And we, in our view, we, we can, I, th I think we're, if we're successful, we will have a zero bill for all those um, all those occupants with a small amount of solar cells on their roof, I'll which is great. Result. Which is great. And I think from memory, it'll be the first in Australia to do this, uh, which we're really excited about. Oh, if we, if we find a vertically integrated business that suits that, we would we would look at acquiring that as well. But yeah. So looking back over the twenty one year journey, what do you reckon you've learnt or about yourself along the way? Gee, that's a uh, that's a curly one. Um, God, I've learned so much, <laughs> and even even at my age, I uh, I, I still realise I do a lot of reading now. Um, when I, I wish I did that when I was younger, but um, the more I know, the realise I realise the more I don't know. To be honest with you, it's it's such an evolving um, evolving beast, the development industry. And really enjoyable. It's fun, but I think you made the comment before. It's the biggest cottage industry in uh, in the world, and I couldn't agree with you more. And what excites me more than anything else at the moment is being able to be involved in what I consider is going to be the biggest revolution in our industry in the next ten years. Which is what reducing labour, finding different ways of building houses, townhouses and apartments in much more efficient ways. Whether it be in factories, you're producing building components, all by robotics or automation, um, taken out on flatbed trucks and erected by a crane in days or weeks rather than years. Um, the te this technology exists already in, in car manufacturing plants uh, all over the world. Why? doesn't exist with, with building in Australia or anywhere else for that matter. Yeah, well it's funny how you can take lessons from another industry and apply them to a new industry and it seems revolutionary. Because I know apparently Henry Ford picked up the production line technique from um, from an abattoir with the way the carcasses were just rolling along the line. And you know that, but that's amazing. And he went, why can't we do that with cars? Yeah. <laughs> they were just rolling the carcass down the line, slicing bits off. Apparently that's the inspiration Beautiful. for the production line. We could do that. We can do that with with components of a of, a, of, a, of an apartment block, or a hotel, or an office. Well, we've got Hadrian out there now, don't we? The robotic bricklayer. We do. We do. But I think there's, he needs some development. <laughs> oh really? Oh, I think that oh, that's a it's a good step though. That's yep. a good step. Really good step. And. Oh, I know. I've been delayed on a project because of bricklayers. Mm. Just they're so busy. Got to wait for them to be able to. Oh, so you, turn must, up. you must have got your pre-sales across the line. Oh, this is the this is the last project. <laughs> no, pre-sales very slow with the current project, unfortunately. So. Right. Uh, you said you learn. You're reading more. What What are you reading? Not magazines. Oh, with, I read um, a lot of biographies now, and now. So I try to take lessons from other people and apply it to my own life. Um, so I hope that there'll be a small element of making less mistakes. 
what's which biography of or which person jumps right, to mind? At right now, I'm reading Phil Knight, who was the founder of um, of Nike. Oh, Shoe Dog. Yes, yeah. Shoe Dog. Yeah, yeah good, book. Right. good book. Good book. So I'm halfway through that. Oh, very good. What would you do differently if you had to start all over again? Gee, that's a good question. I'm sure I'd do a heap of things differently, but would I be the same person as a result? Because, um, yeah, we've, I've been through some really, really tough times and I had to do some staff trimming in the GFC. I've had to beg to banks and everybody else to um, not uh, <laughs> uh, not do anything silly at certain times. I've had to not I've not been able to pay people at certain times in my career as well, which has been hasn't been the case for the last ten years, which is great. But um, it's about communicating and being honest, and I've always uh, I've always been that. But what would I do differently? Um, well, tell us about those, that time when you couldn't pay your bills. What, what are the lessons that you learned there and how do you get through those periods? I can tell you one thing for sure, that if you see a problem, now whether that is paying a contractor, whether that problem is a customer who's upset, whether that problem is an employee who's got an issue, if you do not address it front on, it is only going to get worse. That is one thing I can assure you. So I always make sure that if there's any issue, um, it is it is dealt with immediately. What do you reckon the biggest pickle you've, you've gotten into that you then got yourself out of is? Think of one right now. <laughs> I've been in a heap. You put, um, <laughs> put it in the uh, forget I've been box. Been in a heap. Oh, I try and focus on the good things, <laughs> but I'm sure I've learned a heap from the bad. Look, I've made thousands of mistakes, thousands of mistakes, and it's every time I make a mistake, it's it's I try and learn from it. I do learn from it, and get up and uh, and and reset and go it again. Um, on many occasions, we've lost planning permit applications at VCAT, many occasions. And at no stage have we, have we have I thrown the towel in and, uh, and sold it. We've always picked myself up, picked ourselves up, um, redesigned it, gone back to VCAT and delivered the project. So there's not one project that we've, um, we've on sold in that, uh, in that proviso. Not that I've learned anything about that. It's just I found it easier that the person who knows the project the best is probably the best one to get the planning permit in the end. That doesn't answer your question at all. So I don't, um, yeah, I'm in pickles every day. <laughs> <laughs> I've got 15 pickles outside that door right now uh, that need solving. So is there any major one? We've never had any major ones. Always, uh, if there's a major one, it's always with the bank. Actually, I do know one. Um, we were doing 150 units, 160, 165 units in Parkville about four or five years, more longer, six or seven years ago. And we were three quarters way through construction and um, I was sitting at home and uh, watching the news and the East West Link got announced and the East West Link was going straight through our building. <laughs> so I had a, uh, a very large mortgage at that point. I think it was in the vicinity of about 50 or $60 million with um, the ANZ and I rang, uh, I rang our corporate uh, director, the ANZ, straight away and said, this is the first I know about it, first I've heard about it. So we had 165 uh, apartments all sold to, um, to individual uh, uh, people, a lot of them first home buyers for that, for that sake. And um, the next morning was a, a big strategy meeting about how we're going to work our way out of it. And we instigated a, a plan, a strategy, a, it was based on transparency. It was based on honesty. It was based. There was no. The ANZ was was wonderful. Um, the way they behaved, they could have behaved terribly, and they could have um, sold other assets that they had mortgages over. They could have done a whole whole heap of whole heap of things. They didn't. Um, and 
for that, I'm really grateful. But they, they stuck with us and uh, we, worked with, we, we developed the strategy together and every step of the way I kept them informed um, of our progress on that strategy and the government ended up buying us out uh, in, in, in our entirety. So. Yes, actually I remember that one. Mm. I remember your name popping up in that the media. is the biggest pickle. <laughs> Yeah, they pay, did they pay everyone out in the end, or? Uh, they paid us out, and we um, uh, and the buyers ended up um, they ended up moving the freeway a little bit as yeah. well to accommodate the uh, the apartment block, and uh, the government still owns it. It's been rented out, I think, to um, housing um, to solve our housing crisis. Oh, that's a good good example. Mm. <clears throat> What would be your top tip for developers out there looking to take their business to the next level? Are we talking about um, developers that are just starting out a few years into it or are we talking about veterans? Uh, probably not so much veterans, but people who are doing projects who are wanting to get into bigger projects. At the moment, right now, People are probably going to listen to this podcast for a few years, but we're sitting in 2019 and the market isn't amazing as we discussed before. Uh, so launching into a project now without the qualifying pre-sales, without an exit strategy, I think it's probably time to stick to your knitting right now. I, I wouldn't advise trying to take things to the next level. If you do have a lot of equity or access to a lot of equity or brand is, is being built, just spend more time building your brand, then spend more time with your customers, spend more time, I know that sounds so generic and bullshit, because it's just what everyone says, but um, the easiest sale you're ever gonna make is from an existing customer. So just do the right thing by them, and make sure you've got some spare cash in case something goes wrong, because if you don't, you're gonna lose it a lot. And so what do you foresee happening over the next couple of years? Okay, um, there's so many sectors in that, mm. in that question. Um, there's so many market sectors, there's so many locations, there's so many different variables of that. I'll try and analyze what you, you, you Yeah, want, let's um, know. Keep, it general. keep it general. Um, in, the, in the residential market, this is the residential market where you're getting either apartments or townhouses in, in, in Melbourne, in, 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 a, in a Melbourne, not the CBD so much, given the high controls that have been instigated, there's not much supply coming on board there. I think you'll see a, a dramatic uplift in rents and in investor interest in the latter half of 2020. There's still a lot of stock being delivered in Melbourne in the next 12 months. So a lot of cranes in the air. This, this product was sold two years ago, two and a half years ago, three years ago in some cases. So we've, you've got to remember that we've still got 10,000 people coming into Melbourne and Victoria every single month. So all those people that are coming in uh, have still got housing because it's still being delivered from two and a half years ago. But permit applications and building starts are down by 50 or 60 percent, depending on which um, uh, which stat you're looking at. Blind Freddie can see that we're going to have a housing shortage in 18 months, 24 months. We're going to come out of this thing like a slingshot. And I remember saying this to um, a journalist from Fairfax recently, and the only way the government can, can stop this is by immediately reinstating the Stamp duty, stamp duty benefit on buying off the plan, which will remove any stamp duty, and you can uh, obviously get get a, an existing stock um, uh, that you still pay stamp duty on the existing on the existing product. That will stimulate the industry immediately and get and get products started in the next five six months, and therefore, hopefully, when that stock's delivered. The 10,000 people that are coming here every month actually have somewhere to live. Otherwise, you're going to see rents skyrocket and we are going to have in 
investors jumping over themselves for stock again, and it's just the old merry go round. Yeah, it seems odd. It seems pretty obvious when you've got 120, 30,000 people moving into the state, most of them come to Melbourne. <laughs> State government's forecasting 1.95% population growth for the next three years. It's, you, know, you don't have to be a genius to work out the numbers are pretty big. People have got to live somewhere. But all the, all the people can see right in front of them right now is the fact that we've got a lot of stock still to soak up. We've got a lot of people moving into that, rent, either renting or buying, or they've already bought. And, they're, and they're, obviously when you're an immigrant and you're coming here, whether you've migrated from, from uh, interstate or um, immigrated from overseas, you, you probably rent. And which means all the, the product that's coming on demand, they've, they've still got somewhere to live. But we're not making the starts we were two or three years ago. We're not, we're not, we're not commencing projects. And therefore, we're not going to have somewhere, to, somewhere for people to live, which means there's going to be more demand. Yeah, it'd be good if they introduced some kind of concession for off the plan sales to give some kind of edge to get new stock into the market. Is it just. You do get it if you're an owner occupier, of course, and I know that you're aware of that. You first home buyers get the same advantage, but you don't get it if you're an investor. No, that's right. Um, and it sort of seems counterproductive because if you're trying to bring new stock into the market, you think there should be some incentives for getting it's an easy for people to, to buy new stock. It's an easy way to stimulate it because at the moment, on those 130 or 140 inquiries that, that Pace get a week, we might only get fraction. 10% of those are investor inquiries. Yeah. Um, and to stimulate that and change, it might not change it completely, not flip it on its head, but certainly increase that, that number of inquiries of investors to get the projects off the ground. It's, it's, it would be a major assistance. But if they don't, well, it'll be interesting to see uh, looking back on, on this time right now during 24 months' time. Yeah, we you like to think things will be different, be a bit more robust. I think we'll be in a different marketplace at that point, but the stock actually being delivered on the ground where people can move into, you, you're not going to have it. And that's true, there'll be a, bit, a bubble. All right, well, Shane, it's been awesome talking with you about developing. Beautiful. Is, is there anything else you wanted to add before we, before we wrap up? No, I'd love to circle back in 24 months and see... Uh, and so we can do another one. Well, you'll, just, you'll have to get a, uh, another stand out at the races and we'll do it live. <laughs> live from Flemington during the racing carnival. Uh, it sounds good. It's a good way to blow half a million dollars. <laughs> nice atmosphere in the background. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Cheers. That's all right. If people want to find out more about you or the business, where should they go? Oh, I think there's a bit of a profile on me on, uh, on our website, but... Uh, which is what, Pace Development Group? Um, www.pacedg.com.au. All right, Shane Wilkinson from Pace Development Group. Thanks so much for being on the Property Developer Podcast. My pleasure. Thank See you, you later. See ya. Cheers. Okay, there you go. Another cracking conversation with a guy who has gone all in on his developing career. I hope you enjoyed that discussion as much as I did because there is lots of gold in there about how you can make it as a successful developer. Here's a couple of things I took out of that chat. One, if you really want to succeed as a property developer, you need to go all in. Shane made it clear that he has gone all in with his developing, and in his view, that is what you need to do if you really want to succeed. He has slowly built up the business from humble beginnings and has broken through that ceiling that he spoke about. And now his company has the balance sheet to take on big projects. So how much are you prepared to go all in? Two, deal with problems straight away. I like how Shane was really clear that the best way to deal with problems is to tackle them straight away. Don't let them fester or get out of control. Deal with them early and move on. Simple but powerful advice. Three, learn from your mistakes and keep going. Shane mentioned that he has made thousands of mistakes over the years, but he's picked himself up, dusted himself off, learned from it and kept going. I agree that perseverance is a key trait if you plan on sticking around long term in the developing game. I think the secret is not to make the same mistake twice and not let the stumbles keep you down. What's the biggest mistake you've made so far in your developing career? Let me know by leaving a comment on the page of this episode, number 61, over at propertydeveloperpodcast.com. 
All right, if you enjoyed that conversation with Shane Wilkinson, then you should jump into the past episodes of the show and take a listen to my chat with developer Danny Chiama in episode 30. One of my favorite conversations so far. Danny has delivered some beautiful apartment projects and shares some of his lessons, including this gem about ensuring that you buy the right site. It's about choosing the right site, not not choosing a C-grade site in a C-grade suburb and, and think that it's going to sell well and... By the time you've put three, four hundred thousand dollars into the site, you realise it's not going to sell. There is so much bullion in that conversation that it is definitely worth going back and taking a listen to episode 30 at propertydeveloperpodcast.com. Remember to contact me if you're interested in learning how to develop property safely and profitably. Email Justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com for some info. Don't forget to catch me on Insta and Facebook for all my latest project pics and videos, industry news, and other fun stuff. You can also post a comment on iTunes if you're enjoying the show. And of course, all the past episodes can be found at propertydeveloperpodcast.com. So until next time, may some of your projects become city icons. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.